Eric is assistant professor in molecular biology and psychiatry in the Institute for Brain Science at Brown University. His work at Brown, research, his research work bridges between the molecular and cell biology department and the Bradley Hospital, where he directs the developmental disorders genetics research program. And Eric has also been very involved in an effort called RICART, which stands for the Rhode Island Consortium for Autism Research and Treatment, which I'm hoping he'll tell us about as well. So let me ask you to welcome Dr. Eric Morrow. Thank you very much. Let me just get settled here. So does this point? That points and that advances. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today in the Autism Consortium uh, Symposium. It's really, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to come back. I haven't been gone that long, but it's a pleasure to come back to, um, to see how far it's gone in the few years I've, I've been um, away. Uh, some people might remember I actually presented in the first symposium in 2006 and the progress of the Autism Consortium and, and really of the field of autism research um, has, been, has been phenomenal. Um, so it's good to come back see, and to uh, see old friends and mentors and, and meet some new ones. Um, so thank you. So today I'm gonna present um, a, about a, a part of the autism problem that's near and dear to my heart and that, that is um, what I call difficult to treat autism. Um, and th this is the more uh, severe end of the, of the autism spectrum. Um, and what I wanna present today is while there's been a, a lot of hopeful um, progress in autism research and in treatment um, that's resulted in some improvements in outcome um, for, a for a large proportion of, of the people who are affected with autism, there's been a group that's been left behind, um, and that's the more severe group in terms of um, progress with regard to outcomes. Um, and I'd also, so in today's talk, um, I'll present that there are actually some new initiatives in particular. Um, I'll highlight one at the very end of my talk. Uh, it's funded by the Simons Foundation and L NLM to really understand this group. Um, and that's one very exciting development for this, this proportion of the autism. Um, population. And one theme of my talk today um, will be how you can knit together studies that start with genes and go to the level of populations. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll present on a Rhode Island-based project called the Reichart Registry Project, and how this um, multiple levels of analysis, I think, of, um, of autism is, I think, critical and inherent in, in this sort of um, uh, problem required to solve this sort of problem. So um, the first part of my talk, I'll talk about uh, a, a monogenic um, for, uh, uh, autism-related condition called Christensen syndrome that I study in, in, in my laboratory. Um, and I'll present uh, the relevance to autism. Um, Christensen syndrome results from an, a mutation in an X-linked gene called uh, sodium proton exchanger 6, NHE6. Um, and we've recently been able to show that there's relevance of NHE6 um, in neurotrophin signaling. And at the end of my talk, I'll speculate a little bit whether what this might mean to the larger group of patients with severe autism. Um, and then at the end of my talk, I'll talk about the Reichart registry and again how um, there are a number of researchers and, and hopefully collaboratively uh, with Boston and across the country, this Reichart registry will be used in, in research. Um, but my own interest, again, is to understand the uh, difficult-to-treat population and try to improve outcomes for that population. So people who've heard me speak before um, have seen th this data, but um, for, for those who haven't, uh, let me describe it. Um, for you. This, these are data actually from Catherine Lord's uh, group in her longitudinal studies that were really influential in the way that I think about the autism problem. And some of this might be hard to see, but what's shown here on the um, y-axis is a Vineland social adaptive score. So this is a score that we often will um, give to children in terms of their social skills. 
Um, and then along the x-axis here is age, which goes uh, from around birth to around 15 years old. And what's been charted here um, are a group of patients that she's followed, she followed naturalistically over this period of time, the majority of whom received um, standard of care behavioral treatment. And then she's plotted how, uh, she's plotted against what would be in the dotted line, the control uh, uh, group of ty showing typical development. What she's, what she's shown with each line is the representative um, longitudinal course in terms of social uh, symptoms uh, of various children in her, in her cohort. You don't necessarily need to be a statistician to break out that there's, there's a hopeful message here in a and a more serious message. Um, the hopeful message is that there's a sizable proportion of the children who are improving over time, some of them even um, rating up with the typical developing children. But there's a large group of children here, which I've coined difficult to treat autism, which in their study you can um, measure at you know, around 20% or more, who don't really show significant improvements over time. And so it's the central question in my lab to understand what's different in the developing brain of these children who aren't responding to current treatments to these children, and um, what can we do about it? So um, going forward, one of the themes of my talks uh, is going to be that um, collaborations with families in research is critical for advances. And this is, this is a two-way street. Researchers need to think carefully about um, what the family's primary goals are, and I think also families have to work with researchers to, to um, understand the process of, of research, that sometimes progress is slow. And then the second, the second part um, is that research and in, uh, integration into clinical care and services improves outcomes. Um, and this is, I think these are two themes that the Autism Consortium has really um, held up over, over the years and, and, and helped advanced. So to start, um, the first part of my talk, I'll talk about Christensen syndrome. Um, has anybody in the audience heard about Christensen syndrome? So it's my hope, and, and certainly the hope of the families, um, that in maybe two years, the families who are affected by Christensen syndrome, maybe in two or three years from now, uh, an autism audience like this will understand that Christensen syndrome is a model for severe autism, just like Fragile X or Rett syndrome or Angelman syndrome might be. Um, so Christensen syndrome was initially described uh, by a physician researcher in South Africa who described a large pedigree um, uh, with an X-linked disorder that was given his name. And um, in it he described a syndrome that involved intellectual disability, um, nonverbal, so all of the children are nonverbal, and autistic features. And the data here uh, represents the clinical characterization that, um, of Christensen syndrome that my lab has been conducting in the largest group uh, of patients with Christensen syndrome. At Brown University, we were um, fortunate to be able to host the first uh, family association for Christensen syndrome. So you see the, the picture of all of the children, the families that brought their children to this, to this consortium. And so here are actually children who are affected by Christensen syndrome and some of their typically developing um, children and uh, uh, brothers and sisters in this picture. And so Christensen syndrome is a autism related condition in our study of this um, more than 90% of autistic features and on standardized exams, greater than 40% uh, meet criteria on the ADI or ADOS. My interest in, um, in this disorder stemmed from work that I had done with my prior mentor here um, at Harvard named Chris Walsh, who many of you know. Um, Chris and I found mutations in a related gene, NHE9, so Christensen syndrome is due to the so mutations in the sodium proton exchanger, NHE6. These are highly related proteins. Um, NHE6 is X-linked and far more common. Um, and from estimates, it's probably about 1% to 2% of X-linked developmental brain disorders and around 
one to 20,000 or one to 40,000 children. Um, this slide shows the range of mutations that my lab has characterized in the families that we've enrolled. Um, the protein is an exchanger which lets protons out of endosomes. I'll show you what the endosomes are in a moment. Um, and there are a range of protein truncating mutations that uh, we've been able to discover throughout the protein. So for those um, who need a review on endosomes, uh, endosomes are involved in a variety of cellular processes, include neurotrophin signaling, where a neurotrophin will bind to the receptor and become endocytosin. Actually, neurotrophins signal from wi uh, within endosomes, and they're involved in uh, promoting the branching of neurons and also synapse development, which is obviously critical for circuit development in the developing brain. In our protein here, NHE6 lets protons out of the endosome. The pH, or the proton concentration within the endosomes, is tightly regulated, for example, as endosomes traffic from early, late to lysosomes. Um, and this process is involved in recycling of many receptors, including neurotrophin receptors, where a decision is made as whether to degrade them or to recycle them back to the surface. So it's very important in, in signaling. Um, important enough that it was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize for, for this process um, this, this year. So the first uh, study I'll talk about is the relevance of Christensen syndrome to autism. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with a medical student named Matthew Schwade. So the first part is, as I've described, in the monogenic synd syndrome there are autistic symptoms, but we also discovered that in the brains of um, people with autism, now this is, these aren't brains of children with Christensen syndrome, but they're, they're brains that have been studied um, at post-mortem uh, at the level of transcriptome from children with autism, we find that um, NHE6 is downregulated. So the, the data shown here, I think this is NHE6, shows a downregulation of NHE6 that's statistically significant. It's interesting that the gene I studied with Chris Walsh is actually upregulated um, in autism brains. So these data show that it's important that this pathway um, is, is, it is an important um, convergent pathophysiology for a sizable proportion of children affected by autism. So we've recently been studying, whoa. Sorry. We've recently been studying the mechanism of NHE6. Um, and we've been following the following hypothesis. We think that NHE6, through its regulation of intraendosomal pH, um, is regulating endosomal signaling by neurotrophins. So there are three parts to this hypothesis. The first part that we've been able to prove, and I'll, I'll show you some of the data, is that NHE6 does play a role in arborization and synapse development. The second is that it prevents uh, over-acidification of endosomes. And then the third is that it modulates signaling. And this work has been done uh, by several talented uh, uh, people in my lab, Sophia Lizaraga, uh, Xingyu Wang, um, and in collaboration in electrophysiology with Julie Cower. <clears throat> so the first hypothesis is that NHE6 is involved in endosome development, and we're able to show by staining, antibody staining, that NHE6 stains growing axons and growing dendrites and, and localizes to the synapse. We've developed a knockout mouse, so the protein from NHE6, the protein from the mouse is gone, and we're able to show that the, the branching of neurons is diminished in, in this knockout mouse. And also the synaptic field strength in the hippocampus, this is a physio physiology trace um, from slices in the hippocampus is diminished. And then the second part of the hypothesis is that um, in the absence of NHE6, the endosomes will be more acidified, um, which we've been able to show using live cell imaging, where the pH within endosomes is indeed lower. Um, now, this is actually cells from human patients by iPSC technology. Um, so we've taken cells from those boys who I showed you early on, we programmed them to stem cells and differentiate them into neurons, and what's shown here is replicating our findings in mouse in the human neurons 
um, there's lower pH within the endosomes of the uh, of the the neurons that are now derived from patients. So using this fantastic technology, we've been able to um, now study the neurons, the human neurons derived from the patients. And then the last part of this, um, uh, our hypothesis is that NHE6 uh, modulates neurotrophin signaling. And what we're able to show when we add BDNF to hippocampal cultures that are mutant, there's a, a diminishment in track B levels uh, indicating that uh, we think that track B is, uh, which is the neurotrophin receptor, is being over-degraded in, in the presence of the over-acidified endosome, and there's an attenuation of signaling. So this is what we think is going on in this model for severe autism. We think neurotrophin signaling, um, in particular BDNF, um, the neurotrophin is added to the cells with the, a with the mutation in NHE6, and the endosomes are overly acidified traffic to a greater degree to the lysosome as opposed to being recycled back, which results in less signaling, um, less uh, neuronal development and synapse development. So this is our model, or at least one model for severe autism. So now let me, let me segue to um, the third part of my talk, the last part of my talk, which is the, um, the Reichart project. So the Reichart project has obviously been influenced in a great deal by um, the Autism Consortium. We're hoping it will uh, be an important resource for the community of, uh, resources, uh, of researchers interested in autism. Um, and so the first uh, part, I'll describe the mission, which is um, knowledge and partnership to drive uh, the long-term goals, which are to facilitate collaborative research, inform public policy, and support families. Um, and then the second part, the, the part of the, the project I'll talk about today is the Reichart Registry, um, which is to enroll, it's sort of a little bit of an ambitious goal, but to enroll all interested uh, families in the state of Rhode Island um, who are interested in research into a research registry for longitudinal interdisciplinary and um, patient-oriented research and service provision. So uh, I think I think our, pro our program has some, strength, has some particular strengths that uh, will make this goal accomplishable, I hope. Um, the first is that Reichardt represents a public-private statewide collaboration. So um, in Rhode Island, there's one medical school. Uh, there are several universities, um, and we're all working together. There's a, there's a fairly deep tradition of service provision to families um, and Reichardt involves all of the hospitals and points of care um, who are treating or involved in the lives of people with autism, um, as well as a partnership with, this, with the uh, uh, Department of Education at the governmental level and the Department of Health, as well as both private and public school systems. Um, so we think that the small size um, uh, is, is an advantage and the relatively less complex uh, system which is going to provide an ability for FaceTime. So um, there are lots of families in Rhode Island. They have um, a fairly stable population. In my own genetic studies, we've had uh, many, many families that are two or three generations um, who've been in treatment for, for decades. Um, and uh, it's not far to go to their homes if, if need be. And there's a little less traffic. Um, and reflecting this, there is a very strong record in Brown University in Rhode Island for this sort of longitudinal population-based research. So uh, this shows the number of uh, agencies that are involved. You can get the parallel between the Autism Consortium. It's really too many. Um, for us to name. We have a monthly meeting where actually members of all of these groups come together to discuss progress. Um, and it it's, it's really has a grassroots element to it that has um, been, been quite fun. And it, to follow up on, on, on the pre previous talk, there is a lot of enthusiasm from families to participate. We have a, um, a fairly unique situation wherein this is Tom Anders, many people might know. He's um, a national leader in child psychiatry research. He was involved in developing the Mind Institute, 
So he's moved back out to um, Rhode Island where he has a, a beachside home. <laughs> and he's, quote, retired, end quote, really leading this project uh, with input of other people. And um, his leadership's been critical. Um, and it's a partnership with Steve Scheinkoff, who's um, both a treater and an autism researcher who's been in the community um, for more than a decade. Um, Joanne Quinn uh, is uh, a leader of a, a program called the Autism Project. The Autism Project is a family resource um, provider for families with autism, um, and she herself is, is a parent of a boy with autism. And then uh, Beth Jersky is a neuropsychologist, and she's the research coordinator for the project. So the study design is to enroll all of the residents um, with a diagnosis of ASD, as well as other neurodevelopmental disorders. So we're not restricted to only autism, but we're also including other intellectual disabilities where autism might not be present. We're really interested in the broader group. Um, Recruitment is from both private and public clinics, schools, and population-based methods. And I think one of the essences of our project is, is FaceTime, that we actually want to meet with each of these families, um, at least for uh, a, an initial short visit where we can consent and conduct um, uh, some assessments, including the ADOS. So I think we're among the first large registries that will have um, an ADOS uh, or observational um, uh, assessment in it. Um, we're also including uh, blood samples from uh, parents and other families for genomic and stem cell studies. And I think one of the really important things that um, we're able to do, fortunately, at the present time, um, is provide us, is, is hook up all of the families that are enrolled with an outreach worker, basically a telephone or an email, if you get in trouble, please call this number with regard to autism services. And I think that's an important part of the project. So we just started the project in April, so we actually haven't, beyond quality control checks, looked at the data. But it, so I'm just going to show you one piece which I thought was interesting, which shows uh, the adult population um, that we've so far registered. And, and shows that about 50% of the adults are their own guardian and about 50% the parents are the guardians. And then in terms of their health care decisions, despite the fact that 50% are still their own guardians, there's a strong reliance on, on parents and, and group homes in the provision of their care. So what this means is going forward for, for adults, it's very important that we provide support to continued support to the family networks and also the group homes in terms of um, taking care of, of uh, the adults with, with autism. This is a shout out to a project that I alluded to at the beginning of my talk um, that's uh, being led by Matt Siegel and Susan Santangelo at Maine, funded by NLM and Simons, to um, form a consortium between the inpatient units that treat, for, that treat the most severely affected children with autism, and Bradley Hospital at Brown is, is included in this. So I'll conclude at this point. Uh, I told you about Christensen syndrome, so uh, hopefully raising the awareness about this syndrome and that it represents a new monogenic model for severe autism, a lot like Fragile X or Rett, Rett syndrome. And I've told you a little bit about the cellular mechanism that pacing endosome acidification appears to be the role of NHE6 um, in terms of neurotrophin signaling and circuit development. And I hope I've exemplified some ways that we can use integrated multidisciplinary research going from genes to neighborhoods um, in terms of addressing this problem. So uh, the P of course we have to thank the families that participate in our research. Um, my own lab in particular, the work I showed was uh, led by Xing uh, Wang, Sophia Lizaraga, um, and others. Um, the Reichart project I alluded to is Tom Anders, Steve Scheinkoth, Betch Jersky, Alice uh, Ashley Johnson and Alan Gerber and others, frankly, too, too many important people to, to name. And I have to thank our funders, NIH, Simons, NLM, the Burroughs Welcome, um, and the Brain Science Program and the Rhode Island Foundation is not shown here. So at this point, I think I should stop and take questions um, if there are any. <laughs>